Open your Bible, please, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And we're going to read only the first three verses of this chapter. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 3. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. The date was the 6th of June, 1944. And early in the morning, the Nazi soldiers who were embedded in the cliffs on the Normandy, above the Normandy beaches, uh, looked through their binoculars, expecting that it would be a day like just about every other day for the last months. There had been rumors of a coming invasion of the Allied forces from England, maybe at Calais, uh, further north along the French coast. But they were unprepared for the shocking vision that emerged out of the fog and rain. The haze of this very special morning that had been planned for two years by the Allies. 7,000 ships. And by the time the D-Day invasion had really geared up, 132,000 Allied soldiers from the United States, from Great Britain, and from Canada, had steamed across the English Channel in the night to plant their weapons and boots on Normandy's beaches. And if you put the Americans, the Canadians, and the Brits all together, you've got 24,000 paratroopers, 24,000 men hopping out of planes and going across the edge of that fortified area that Hitler's troops had been made had been making for some time to protect the continent from uh, Allied invasion. Uh, they just flew over those barriers, and you know the rest of the story. And so now, some 80 years or so plus later, when we think about D-Day, we think about a tremendous triumph to hold what was then, I guess you could call it technocracy, certainly a dictatorship that would have created havoc around the world, managed to hold it at bay. And we have had, for the last 80 years or so, with the exception of the Yugoslav War in the 90s, a reasonable amount of peace in Europe. The invasion, for those Nazi guys looking at their binoculars, was a shocker. They knew something was afoot, but they did not expect what they saw. And I think about that day when I read these three verses in 1 Thessalonians 5. We have taken time in the beginning of this year to talk about some important themes in what the Bible teaches about future events. We spent some time talking about the Bema seat judgment, when believers in Jesus Christ will be rewarded by God's grace in relationship to their service for the Lord. We've taken time to talk about the snatching away of the church to be with Christ. And once the church is removed, as we will see going forward, restraint uh, of the evil one will be removed. And we have looked at a number of key passages that uh, point to the fact that the church will be taken out of the world well before the final judgment. John chapter 14, verse Thessalonians 4, the verses that precede our text for tonight. And uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, point to the notion that the church has a special promise to be removed from the earth before the coming of the day of the Lord. And tonight, in the, in the coming uh, months, Lord willing, if God gives us freedom and physical strength, 
we want to continue our study by looking at what happens after the catching away of the church. And we want to look at what the Bible calls the day of the Lord, which is a, a uh, phrase that is used for an extended period. In the Old Testament and in the New, this expression, day of the Lord, has a very particular meaning. And the context of each passage will dictate what the day of the Lord is. In some passages, the day of the Lord can englobe a time of judgment and a time of the rule of the Messiah in the earth. And just as Jewish days began with the nighttime and were finished in the day, in the beginning of the evening of the next uh, 24 hour cycle, so the day of the Lord that is yet future will begin in a time of deep darkness, which will usher in a time of daylight. The time of deep darkness is going to be discussed in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. There are other passages where the phrase day of the Lord focuses on one aspect of this lengthy period. And the day of the Lord, as we're going to see in a number of passages this afternoon, is going to concentrate on the beginning of that future lengthy period, the time of, of judgment, which will come as a surprise. What I would like us to think about this afternoon in the brief minutes we have uh, with us is, first of all, a simple challenge to realize that biblical prophetic themes are important. And then secondly, we want to be warned. So let's take those two things in that order. Verse 1 is a challenge to me as I think about the implications of what Paul is saying to the church in Thessalonica. Of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Please note what is not said. Paul does not say, now as to the times and the seasons, these questions are of no importance at all. In fact, what is going to come down the road in the future is known only to God. We don't know what's going to happen, so just don't worry about it. Be happy. Paul does not say that. He says, as to the times and seasons, that is, the word times refers to the uh, periods of time which may be extended, and the seasons, the word is better um, translated with the notion of uh, hinge points in the outworking of God's plan. Extended periods and specific hinge points, points where we move from one economy of God to another economy of God. In, in regard to those things, I don't have to write to you as if you were ignorant because you have already been informed. And that implies something very significant, and that is that Bible prophecy is important to know about, because Paul had already instructed them on this. The Thessalonian believers, who were brand new converts, Paul had spent about three or four weeks with them, and then had had to leave under pressure, they underwent persecution by Jews in the synagogue in that city. There was some false teaching that was coming in. There was pressure coming in from various sides. Paul wrote to them uh, in, a, in a rather short period of time. He had been with them uh, no more than a month, and he had covered some of this material in the process of bringing them to Christ and giving them some basic instruction. Bible prophecy is important, and we know that because... The Apostle Paul and all of the other New Testament writers deal with these themes. And that is why we must not ignore them. And it is also why we dare not misinterpret them. These things have great practical significance. When Kathy and I were in Luxembourg in September and I had a chance to go over the second part of this uh, church history class, we looked at the development of uh, churches in Europe and in North America and South America and 
the rest of the world, primarily in the Western uh, historical theater, shall we say, and, and noted that many of the reformers who came out of Germany and France, Switzerland, stuck with the Roman Catholic Church's interpretation of prophetic themes while emphasizing the importance of a return to the authority of Scripture only and the importance of salvation by grace through faith alone. It's very difficult to fight a battle on all fronts. Maybe you've noticed that in the history of warfare. If you were attacked on 12 fronts as a small country, you better have some uh, very special weapons and some very dedicated soldiers to be able to win because uh, an all fronts attack cannot be sustained. And in the Reformation period, the crucial question that emerged in the time of Luther, Calvin, and those who followed these men was uh, what do you do with buying your salvation? There were people going around Germany selling indulgences, and Luther said, this is not right, and I'm going to write a series of 95 little paragraphs to refute the notion that you can be saved by buying your way out of purgatory in hell. And it created a whole movement that dealt with the question of salvation. <clears throat> Many of these Protestant groups didn't, they simply did not have time to deal with the questions of prophetic themes. And probably without realizing it, they kind of left that part of the study of Scripture by itself, untouched, relatively speaking. There were some groups uh, always that wanted to return to the notion of a future kingdom on the earth. But by and large, the Protestant movement and the Roman Catholic Church remained committed to the idea that the kingdom was now, that the church is the kingdom, and that the church has replaced Israel forever, and God has no future for the, the land of Israel, for the people of Israel in their land. Those things must be reinterpreted in the light of New Testament revelation. So the question of prophecy is important, and how we interpret it is important, because it has an impact in your life. Just look around you at the situation in Spain today, and consider how many people there are, young people and older people, who say, well, I was baptized, my parents uh, sprinkled some water on me, and um, just as people entered Israel, if they're this informed, entered the people of Israel through circumcision, I entered into the church through baptism, and so therefore I'm a Christian, and therefore I'm a son of God, or a child of God, and uh, I'm good to go, and the priest will take care of me. Church, Israel, essentially the same thing, different administration, and you get into the visible church without becoming a believer, just as you get into the land of the people of Israel without necessarily becoming a believer. Not every Jew that lived in the land of Israel was a believer in God, a person who trusted in God, and yet he was nonetheless an ethnic Jew. And so there are many people in Protestantism today who believe that you get into the church, the visible church, the church membership, by receiving baptism either as a child or as an adult, and that brings you into the visible church. And you don't have to be a believer, you don't have to be regenerated, but you're still part of the church. And there's a direct link between that notion, which is incorrect, and how one views prophetic themes. We say it in theological shorthand, your ecclesiology, which you believe about the church, is tied in intimately with your eschatology, which you believe about the future. Because what we believe about the future and God's purposes for Israel and what Israel is, is tied into our understanding of what God's program for the church is. And, and to be correct and be in good health in both of these areas, they, we need to be consistent. Mm -hmm. And many, there are many people who are truly born again in various denominations who do not realize that they're inconsistent because they have been taught one thing and that they take it on faith, just as if you've been coming to this church for the last 25 years or so, you take some things on faith because uh, you trust Pastor Sam. Ultimately, 
Uh, we all trust in a teacher, but we need to go back and examine everything that a teacher tells us by going back to the scripture and comparing scripture with scripture because no teacher on this planet is infallible, but this book is. Mm -hmm. Let me just underscore this one, one more time. And here's the challenge for us. Prophetic themes are important. They are practical. They have an impact in people's lives. And although it is possible to have a false notion of prophetic themes and still be a believer, as generation follows upon generation, as we disciple others, our false teachings will have an impact in the um, generations that follow. And if we don't get this right, then our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren can have false, um, a false faith, a, a trust in their Christian heritage and believe that they are um, part of God's family simply because of a ritual that occurs in a local church. And that is tied in to what we believe about the future. And I'm going to go back to this on a regular basis because I know that it's not always something we immediately see on and say, oh yeah, I see that, I get it. 1 Thessalonians 5.1, I don't have to write to you about times and seasons. It is implied you already know about these things. Mm -hmm. And if they already knew about these things and they were just new believers, that means Paul taught them these things, which means that prophetic themes were part of basic Bible doctrine given to new believers in the apostolic age. And you can go to Paul's writings, you can go to James' writings, you can go to Peter's writings, John's writings. All of them deal with prophetic themes. In fact, roughly a quarter of the whole Bible, when it was given originally, dealt with prophetic themes with relationship to the time of the readers. In the Old Testament, there were many prophets who spoke about things that were to come, some in short order, and some much further down the road. And so we dare not ignore these things. This is a challenge for us to enjoy the blessings and wisdom that await us if we delve into these issues with care. I think about Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, the book that many people don't dare to read because they say nobody can understand it. But the introduction to the book of Revelation says, Blessed is the one who reads, and those who hear the words of the prophecy and eat the things which are written in it, for the time is near. There's a blessing to know what is coming down the path for God's people. That's the challenge. Let me talk the rest of the time about a warning. Because in verses 2 and 3, we see that the day of the Lord is going to be devastating. Now, the Thessalonians had some questions about future topics. They wondered, according to chapter 4, verses um, 13 through 18, whether or not loved Christians who had died would miss out when Christ returned for the church. And Paul answers that question in that paragraph. But they had a second question which he answers in chapter 5. And the second question is going to be clear to us, I think, when we think about these verses, what we're going to look at tonight and what we're going to look at, God willing, in following months. The second question concerned the day of the Lord. Uh, we see it also in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that there were Thessalonians who had been told by somebody that they were already in the day of the Lord. And so they wondered, um, was, were some things that Paul said not clear to them? Or maybe they were false. We need to take a couple steps back on this question of the day of the Lord, because it is a major Old Testament theme. And we got a, a very late start this evening, and so we're not going to have time to read uh, all the relevant passages, but if you're taking notes, here are some that you might want to look at on your own time, and I will read a couple of them, 
to give us a, a bit of a flavor of what the Old Testament has to say about the day of the Lord. If you go to the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 2, I want you to join me in reading from verse 10. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 10. Enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust, for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, and upon every one that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. And upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, and upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills that are lifted up, and upon every high tower, and upon every fenced wall, and upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all pleasant pictures, and the loftiness of men shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. The idols he shall utterly abolish, and they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats. These are the animals that live in the caves. To go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? Now that shocking tone is borne out in many other Old Testament passages where the day of the Lord is presented as a time when the earth is shaken and when proud men are leveled. And it's very interesting that this passage in Isaiah chapter 2 talks about people going, to the, going into the caves. We see the same thing mentioned in the book of Revelation, which speaks about the time of judgment that will precede the, the visible appearing of Christ to set up his kingdom. And men will go into the caves and will ask for the mountains to fall upon them so that they can die. The, the caves, maybe some of the caves of Spain, I don't know, there are plenty of caves in the world, uh, will be a place of refuge to get away from God's judgment. But, of course, that's not going to work. You go a little bit further. Let me just give you a few passages. We don't have the time to read them. Isaiah chapter 13, verses 1 to 16, is an oracle of judgment against Babylon. And God refers to that as... Uh, the day of the Lord. It's an experience, he says in verse 8, that is like labor pains. Verse 10 says that the whole universe will be affected. And verse 12 says that people will be decimated. That passage could not have been fulfilled by the destruction of Babylon by the Medo-Persian Empire. This passage has universal proportions. And it is very interesting to see that the day of the Lord is like the labor pains that come upon a woman. We'll see that as well in a few moments in Jeremiah. Joel, look at Joel chapter 2 and Joel chapter 3. You find another reference to the day of the Lord, which is characterized as a day of darkness when God has a mighty invading army. And it's an intriguing, intriguing book because Joel chapter 1 talks about locusts who come into the land of Israel and just <laughs> eat everything. And chapter 2 talks about another invading army which, is, which acts like locusts but seems to be a, an actual invading army that is going to come into Israel. And it's a very familiar passage at the end of chapter 2 where you see that uh, the 
The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon as well. There will be blood, fire, and brimstone upon the earth before the gathering of all the nations in the valley of Jehoshaphat. And the passage says that these will be judged for their attitude toward the people of Israel and with regard to the dividing up of the land of Israel. Amos 5.18, similar idea. The day of the Lord will be a time of darkness and not light. Obadiah, verse 15, there's only one chapter. Obadiah, verse 15. The day of the Lord draws near the time of judgment upon all the nations. This is a universal judgment. And then if you look at Zephaniah, the first chapter, Zephaniah is a kind of mini uh, description of the day of the Lord in just three chapters. God reveals that, uh, that the whole world will be affected by the day of the Lord. You check those passages out um, at, at some time this week. This is not an exhaustive list of passages that talk about the day of the Lord, but it's a good example. And you will find that if we were to summarize what these passages say about the day of the Lord, we would observe that the sun and the moon will be darkened, God's wrath will be poured out upon the world, there will be, at the end of it, salvation for Israel and restoration to her land, after a time when the nations will wage war against the people of Israel, and uh, wicked nations will be wiped out at the climax of the judgment phase of the day of the Lord, there will be judgment on the great and terrible day of the Lord in the Valley of Decision, which is the Valley of Jehoshaphat, this verse, but particular geographic location. It'll be a time of anguish and torment, of turmoil, of confusion, death, and massive destruction. Many of you saw video clips of what happened in Valencia this week. And we kind of shudder to think about several thousand people in one day just being wiped out by mud that gets launched from the surrounding mountains uh, in that area around that city just six hours north of us. Um, somebody was yesterday telling me about some uh, elderly people sitting in an old folks home who were discovered um, in their wheelchairs sitting uh, waist deep in mud, unable to get out. I think this is, this is horrific. My friends, if what the Old Testament sees about the coming day of the Lord is true, Valencia is a circus. Yeah. Because there is a way out for many of these people. The day of the Lord is an Old Testament theme, and when we read about it here in verse 2, you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. I've already told you this. Think about what I have told you previously. You know it perfectly well that the day of the Lord is going to come suddenly, like a thief in the night, unexpectedly. Verse 3 adds a little detail. When they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon that, that phrase is an intriguing one, isn't it? When they shall say peace and safety. You could interpret it in one or two ways. You could say, well, maybe they're wishing for peace and safety. There's some Old Testament texts where false prophets <coughs> told the kings of Israel and Judah, don't worry, everything will be fine. There will be peace and safety in your time. These were false prophecies, and there were true prophets who would rise up and say, no, no, expect that Babylon is going to come, or the Assyrians are going to come, there will be judgment. No, 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 you don't have to listen to that guy. He's, he's just depressing. Those, it's peace and safety, everything will be fine. They were wishing for it, but it was a false wish. We could also interpret this statement, peace and safety, to be a uh, assertion that peace and safety have been achieved, mm -hmm. right? You hear this in the news from time to time, that people say, well, we've, finally we, we've, 
we've resolved a major problem. Now, I can't remember actually the last time I heard people in the media saying we finally resolved this or that problem. Um, we're living in curious times. But I think it's quite clear what the meaning is in the passage when you look at the context. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. It's like a thief in the night. Think about the metaphor of this, uh, maybe a, a nighttime burglary in your house. You and your family are sleeping comfortably. The house is secure. After all, the windows are closed. Your electronic alarm system is switched on. Everybody knows that there's no way to get around those. <laughs> Front door is bolted shut. Why worry? But at 2 o'clock in the morning, someone with a skeleton key and an intimate knowledge somehow of your alarm system codes manages to unlock the door and slip in quickly, shut off the motion sensors, shut down the electronics, and somehow they know right where to get your cash, if you still use cash, and go for your credit cards, your jewelry, maybe some other valuables in your house, and they know where to find the key to your car and go into the garage and open the garage and take off with your car. And you snore on. You never expect the thief to come. Thieves don't make appointments, right? They are unexpected. And if they come unexpectedly, there's a chance they will succeed. That's how the day of the Lord will come. It will come suddenly, unexpectedly, that is unexpectedly on the part of those who reject God's truth. And what is unique here in the passage is to see that people do not expect the coming of the day of the Lord because they say peace and safety. In other words, they are somehow assured that the major problems of the world are finally resolved. They will sense peace and safety, otherwise the thief would not be able to come and take their valuables. Peace and safety will be ex expressions of, of relief and false confidence, not urgent cries of alarm. They, they will feel that all is well. Why would that be? The day of the Lord, when we read the whole <coughs> scope of revelation on this topic, the day of the Lord is launched with the setting up of a treaty between a coming prince and the people of Israel related to their land. And that treaty will last seven years, according to Daniel 9.27. In the middle of that period, the treaty will be broken. broken, violated. But at the beginning, a covenant will be made with many in Israel, Daniel says. And when we read in the book of Revelation, we find that the, the opening seals of judgment opened by the Lamb of God allow for the coming of a person who will take peace from the earth, which implies that there will be a certain peace, apparently, in the beginning of this period of the day of the Lord, that right at the beginning it will look like we finally got our act together. A world leader will emerge who promises peace and safety and will seem to Pull it off. This reminds us of Jesus' comments about the tribulation period resembling the days of Noah, where people ate and drank and made merry and gave their children in marriage, in marriage and until, bingo, the heavens opened, the fountains of the great deep were broken up, there was volcanic activity, I don't know if there were there was shifting of tectonic plates exactly. We we don't have uh, geological detail in in the book of Genesis about everything that went on, but the change was abrupt and sudden from one day to the next. No more giving in marriage, no more eating, no more drinking because the floods came up. It was Valencia exponentially repeated around the world. A global judgment. Everything's fine. Look at that guy Noah. He's been building this barge, this boat for hundreds of years. What an idiot he is. 
And now he's in there, and, and the, the door is closed. And I, I wonder what they're doing in that big barge. You know, I mean, they've been in there for the last seven days. And the thunder starts, and the waters begin to, oh, um, not, 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 maybe we'd like to get into the barge. Too late. Unexpectedly, the day of the Lord comes upon those who do not believe God's warnings. And so I believe that this paragraph talks about peace and safety that is temporary and precedes the whole period of the day of the Lord at, at the very beginning. I don't know how long it will last. And then suddenly and unexpectedly, we're going to have a removal of the very security that people will have vaunted. Now, as we're going to see later in this passage, believers will not be caught surprised by the day of the Lord because they don't belong in the nighttime. The day of the Lord is the people who are of the night. And we will see this in the next paragraph as we study a little further. Those who are of the night live like nighttime people. And those who live among them but who are of the day are to live like daytime people. And Paul asserts that those who are of the day will not be caught by surprise by the day of the Lord because they belong to another realm. They are of the light and, and according to chapter 4 they're going to be caught away to be with the Lord before the day of the Lord occurs and starts. When you think about the descriptions that we find in the Old and New Testament of the day of the Lord, you realize when you look around us that this could certainly occur in our generation. Yeah. Could have occurred earlier if God had so wished. But it is not at all unrealistic and certainly less unrealistic than ever before to take the prophetic passages at face value as things that are really going to happen in history. Because Jewish people are back in their land since 1948. Something that had not happened, that is the existence of a state, had not existed for a couple thousand years. Although there was always a Jewish presence in the land of Israel, there was no self-governing people in that land. There are movements in Israel that are prepared to build another temple, although the present government is very hostile to that notion. The attention of the world is focused on the Middle East, probably as never before, or not since 1968, 67, and the 1970s when you had the Six Day War and the Yom Kippur War. Uh, as we speak here on uh, this first Sunday in November, there are plenty of rumors afoot that in the next few days uh, Iran might attack the land of Israel as it never has before and that Israel may even make a preemptive strike to completely annihilate the Iranian nuclear project. Uh, that part of the world is pretty important in the news. Just as prominent as elections that will occur across the ocean on Tuesday. Uh, Europe is trying to create a pan-Mediterranean culture that is rooted in the belief that um, the God of Abraham, who is the initiator of the Jewish religion and the Christian religion and Muslim religion, that um, th this will bring unity to, to the European mainland. See the rise of anti-Semitism, which is a major hallmark of the day of the Lord. People will persecute the Jews as never before. And the great leader who emerges to promote peace and security at the beginning, by the time the middle of that seven year period is, is uh, launched, is going to, to try to eliminate all Jews on the whole face of the planet. Revelation chapter 12. So there will be another Holocaust that will make the first Holocaust seem mild. Think about a world economy, a world government, which is spoken of in the book of Revelation. There will be one government where one person will rule the whole world, although there will be factions 
that rise up against him. There will be a united economic system, and if you want to buy and sell, you must have some kind of mark, whatever that will be, on your hand or on your forehead. Much speculation about that. A uh, hundred years ago, people kind of laughed at these statements. Today, they are very much possible, very feasible with the technology that we have, and we still wonder what AI applications are going to mean. So if the, the day of the Lord were only a few years away, I guess the question we need to ask is, would you be caught unaware? Mm -hmm. Would you be caught by surprise? Would you be like a family snoring in bed when the thief comes unexpectedly? Or would you be the people of the light who will have nothing to do with that period because you are part of God's people. You're not caught by surprise because you watch what's going on in the world and you anticipate realistically what God is going to do in the future. The day of the Lord is an important Old Testament theme. It will come unexpectedly and it will be excruciating. Let me try to wrap this up. Um, when you see the end of verse 3, you see a reference to travail that comes upon a woman with child. When they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. I want you to see one other Old Testament passage here as a cross reference that I think is very important to underscore. In the uh, Old, Testament, Old Testament prophet Jeremiah, chapter 30, look at verses 5 and 7. We'll begin in verse 4. Jeremiah 30, verse 4. These are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. Notice the application to these two groups of Jewish people, north and south. For thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now and see whether man doth travail with child. Uh, this is a good postmodern question for 2024. Uh, should you be called a childbearing person? As if men could bear children. Has anybody ever met a man who can give birth to a child? Well, obviously not. Follow up question, verse 6. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail? She's ready to give birth. And all faces are turned to paleness. Look at all these men who look like they're going to bear a child any day. Well, no, any moment. Important metaphor that is repeated in Isaiah, Jeremiah, and we see it mentioned here in 1 Thessalonians 5 as well. Verse 7, alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. So the day of the Lord where grown men hold their loins in pain and anguish and abject fear is a time that applies particularly to Jacob's travail. It is the people of Israel who are suffering those pains of bringing a child into existence. And that child, that baby that is born of Jacob, is the believing remnant that is going to enter into the kingdom of Messiah. He shall be saved out of it. There will be salvation for Jewish people out of that day. Verse 8, For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him, but they shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. This is a time of the victory and salvation for the Jewish people. But it is launched with a time of travail. It is the pain of giving birth. Now, roughly half of you have gone through this experience. <laughs> uh, I've gone through it vicariously. I have observed the pain of childbirth more than once. And my observation is, I'm glad that God made me a man. Because birth pains are excruciating. Jesus uses exactly the same terminology 
in Matthew chapter 24, when he talks about the things that are yet future for the Jewish people and the nations. Look at verse 21. Um, now, we don't have time to read the whole context, which deals with the setting up, verse 15, of the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. And Jesus says, if, if you see that desolation, that statue uh, in the temple that is set up, then don't go back and get your, your shirt and tie. Get out of Jerusalem, Jewish people. Don't go back to your field to get your clothes because this is going to be a terrible time especially if you're pregnant. Verse 21, Then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. In other words, if this time of judgment were extended indefinitely, there wouldn't be a living person alive in the face of the planet. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. There's a limit to that. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive even the very elect. Now this period uh, is related to the beginning of birth pangs. Because when you read the beginning of the chapter, you see that he refers to false Christs, verse 5. Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, I'm the Messiah. Shall receive many. You shall hear of wars, rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. The end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of birth pangs, of sorrows. It's the same term that's talking about the travail of a woman. He's using the same terminology that you find in Jeremiah chapter 30. Jewish readers familiar with the Old Testament would have recognized that term and would have realized that Jesus is talking about the birth pangs of the Messiah, which will usher in the coming of the Messiah. These are the beginning of the birth pangs. Now, if you're old enough to know some basic biology, you realize that for most women, birth pangs start... Suddenly, not totally unexpectedly, but suddenly, and then grow in intensity until the baby comes. For some women, this happens in a very short period. For others, it can be a matter of several days, and it's great suffering. The analogy is that there is a beginning of the period of birth pangs, including false messiahs who will mislead many, wars and rumors of wars, famines, and death through pestilence and earthquake. And these are the, exactly the same things that are mentioned in the opening uh, chapters of the book of Revelation, in chapter 6 in particular, where the first four seals are open, and they match beautifully what Jesus says are going to be the beginning of birth pangs. And those birth pangs will continue until the baby comes, which is the arrival of regenerate Israel when the Messiah returns to set up his kingdom. Birth pangs, then, are found in the Old Testament. They are mentioned by Jesus. They are mentioned here in 1 Thessalonians 5.3. While they are saying, peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly, like birth pangs. Actually, it is in the singular in the Greek text. Like the pang upon a woman with child. And this has led some Bible students to conclude that the pang that is mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 5 since it is in the singular, is the first labor pain which the world does not expect. Oh. Better call my husband. Get ready. When the pain comes, it is unexpected and it is an announcement of destruction and pain. And you find, intriguingly, a very similar thing in, in ancient Judaism. The Babylonian Talmud said this, Our rabbis taught in the seven-year cycle at the end of which the son of David will come, 
At the conclusion of the Septante, the Son of David will come. Jewish tradition that expects the coming of the Messiah preceded by a seven year period of suffering and difficulty for Jewish people. In some of the Dead Sea Scrolls, you see references to the birth pangs of the Messiah, a severe trouble which would mark the seven years before the Messiah, Messiah's coming will be called the birth pangs of the Messiah, the messianic woes. And there were some rabbis who even said that they did not want to be alive when the messianic age was imminent. And they would say, let him come, but I don't want to see him because I know what's going to happen before the Messiah arrives. It's going to be horrible, horrific. And if all this is true, isn't it legitimate for us to call people to save themselves from Fletcher Dime by taking refuge in Christ? You know, there are a lot of people who say, oh, you guys who are, you guys, you people who, uh, I've just come back from the United States, you'll have to excuse me for my language. You people who believe in the rapture of the church preceding the coming uh, of the tribulation period and then the return of Christ, you're just chickens. <laughs> you want to opt out. We must be manly and be ready to go through the tribulation with courage. You know, the appeal of Scripture in Old and New Testament is God's judgment is going to come. There's going to be an ultimate judgment when we stand before the throne of God, and if we are not believers, we will be judged by the works that are recorded in heaven. But the appeal of salvation is you need to escape that. Don't don't play around with God's judgment. And there are also passages that talk about the judgment of the nations and the judgment of Jewish people in this earth before the kingdom that will last a thousand years and which will never be overcome and which will usher us into the eternal state. During that time of judgment, earthly judgment of the nations, uh, once you get into that period, don't assume you're going to be able to escape it. Get out! You know, if, if you are a responsible adult and you rear your little children, you teach them to hold your hand when you cross the street because there might be a car coming in either direction to kill them. Keep your eyes open. Look both ways. Escape disaster. You say, well, you know, one must be, one must allow one's children to express their own will. So I'm not going to hold on to my kids if they want to cross the street. Let them cross the street. They're autonomous units. You know, why shouldn't you repress your child and say, hold on to my hand? Uh, people with that mentality ought to be arrested. <laughs> right? Amen. And so if the, the Bible warns us of a time that is coming where God's judgment and wrath is going to fall upon the world, the nations of the world, and upon Jewish people who disdain the gospel to ferret out those who hate God and raise their fists against God and take them into eternity and allow those who are believers to survive. If God is going to do that in time and space in history for his own purposes, and if now we still have time to get out of that time, then it is only suitable that we warn people about what's coming. And that is the usefulness of prophetic passages. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wake up, folks. The thief is coming. Don't snore. Be awake. Because as it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, what a sobering end to verse 3. Did you notice that? It says in the end of verse 3, they shall not escape. There are many people who, when they hear the Bible's warnings about things to come, say, this is what they say about the gospel, call many times as well. Well, you know, I'm still uh, uh, young and in, uh, in my right mind. So when I retire, and I have time to play golf and read books and maybe turn some pages in the Bible. I'll give some serious thoughts of spiritual things. But right now, I want to make money. Or I want to study. I want to get married. I want to have kids. I want to have grandchildren. I want to be somebody in this world. Well, there's plenty of time to talk about this later on. That kind of putting off until tomorrow is immensely dangerous. Because the notion that one day we can 
escape, that we will have the luxury of getting out of trouble is presumptuous. There's no guarantee you'll get home tonight. <clears throat> and when this passage says that they, that is those who proclaim with assurance that there will be peace and safety and then are subject to some destruction, they will not escape. That certainly suggests, doesn't it, that a, a, a hardening, a spiritual hardening of the heart could come in. Those who are self-assured in that time will not be able to change their minds. And consider that possibility, that those who will have heard the gospel message before the day the Lord starts, and have repressed and said, no, 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 that's for later, I'm not interested, I don't need that. Once the day of the Lord begins, and everything falls apart, they, instead of saying, oh, I'm going to change my mind, maybe a spiritual hardening will come upon them that they cannot reverse, just like Pharaoh hardened his heart, and hardened his heart, and hardened his heart, and then there came a time when God hardened his heart. And there was no escape for Pharaoh. Because mm -hmm. it's too late. And maybe our neighbors are like that. Some of them have never heard the gospel. They need to hear it from us. I hope that you're engaging people who live on your flat, uh, in, in, in your apartment block, and people who live next to you, that you're looking for opportunities to talk about serious things. You know, one of the things I've noticed is that with the chaos uh, going on all around us, there are far more opportunities to talk to people That's about right. really Amen. important things in their world. It's fantastic. Amen. Yesterday afternoon, we, we just gotten back, and uh, our neighbors across the way uh, said hello, and nice to have you back, and uh, how was your trip to America, and what's the situation in America? Well, I talk about an open door. Huh? America's a divided country, it's chaotic, look at the candidates who are available, <laughs> and this is anyone that you really want to say, wow, that's really it. Shade up, you know, a masterpiece of integrity and uh, and political, uh, you know, prowess and good ideas. It's it's a bad situation in the United States. And then in the course of the conversation, which went on about forty minutes, an español, the best I could, I underscored the fact that the real problem in America is not political or economic. It is un problema espiritual y moral. Right. And that little sentence, I know we will talk about another time, mm -hmm. because we've already talked about that with those people, and they want more of it. And I hope you have some people that you talk to that you can warn that the real issues are talked about in Scripture. Right. Do you say to yourself, tomorrow I'll take time for these matters, don't put them off. Tomorrow may be too late. And to say this is not to be spectacular, sensational, it's just realistic. This passage in 1 Thessalonians 5 is not talking about the tribulations of the church. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation." But the coming day of the Lord, which will fall upon those who are of the night and not taken to be with Christ, is a time that could come in our day. We could be on the cusp of it. We could be walking along the edge of the cliff. And so we need to be, if we are members of Christ's family, of his church, we need to be voices that put the light into people's uh, minds. Amen. And in the conversation day by day. I hope you're looking for opportunities to do that. And we need to be praying for one another that God will give us the boldness and the wisdom to be like this. Because if we are of the light, we have a message of hope. And we know it's coming down the road. Let's be people who are challenged by the importance of biblical prophecy. This is practical. And let's be warned because these things are sure to come. Amen. And maybe sooner than we think. Father, we thank you for this passage which gives us instruction. <coughs> Help us to take these things to heart. And this week, would you open up doors of conversation for us? 
with those whom we know and perhaps with those whom we do not yet know, so that your word would be spread here in the south of Spain and other places. We give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.